Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott McGuire. I'm vice president with Green State Credit Union here in Dubuque and your YP board president. On behalf of myself, the YP board and the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, we thank you for joining us today for our May YP luncheon. A reminder to everyone, uh, if you do have questions, there's a little chat box over in the right hand corner. Uh, please feel free to put questions in there. Justine will moderate that and uh, relay questions to our speaker uh, during the presentation. Um, quickly, I'd like to take a minute to recognize our sponsors that make our presentation today spot possible. Our ultimate presenting sponsors are Medical Associates, Midwest One Bank, Q Casino, and TH Media. Our silver and YP corporate sponsors are Cart Cartograph, Collins Community Credit Union, Cottingham and Butler, Dupaco Community Credit Union, Dutrack Community Credit Union, Eagle Point Solar, Forge Social, Fidelity Bank and Trust, Grand River Center, Grand River Medical Group, Green State Credit Union, John Deere Dubuque Works, Kitzinger, Harmon, Conrarty Attorneys at Law, Kunkel and Associates, McCoy Group, McGraw-Hill, Origin Design, formerly IIW, Pepper Sprout, Tyson's Home Farm Auto, and Platinum Supplemental Insurance. Uh, thank you to all of our sponsors. We appreciate that. And uh, um, with that, we will jump into our speaker today. I'm pleased to welcome Zach Keeling. He's the CEO of Medical Associates Clinic, PC, and Medical Associates Health Plans. Uh, he's sharing his presentation today uh, with the topic, Lessons Learned. Um, a little bit about Zach. Before he joined Medical Associates as Chief Operating Officer in 2006, he worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota, a 525,000-member plan with revenues exceeding $1.5 billion in Coventry Healthcare, a Fortune 500 managed care organization. Zach earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Doan College in Nebraska. Zach and his wife, em Zach's wife Emily, is a human resources professional, and they are proud parents of two-year-old Charlie. Zach, thank you for joining us today, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Scott. Can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. You just need to put it in presentation mode. Oh, it's not in presentation mode. Well, it is on my side. Let me do it again. All right. How about now? seeing the view where we can see the next slide you may want to just go to sharing and hit the show screen yeah i did that all right let me do it one more time that's okay the content's there they're uh i'll just kind of Got flip. It. so all right well anyway when when i was asked to uh to present i really was trying to figure out you know what would be what would i want to know when i uh if I was on the YP board or what would be, or on YP or what would be valuable. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm 42, so I've aged out of uh, being eligible for YP, but the, um, you know, obviously being a, a first time CEO, I thought there was different things that I learned as I kind of went through the different stages of my career that, you know, it's not necessarily, everybody takes their own path, everybody figures it out. But I thought if I could share a few of the tidbits that I picked up that would have been nice had I known beforehand, um, then I think we can, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll glean something out of that as you uh, continue in your careers. So with that, um, like, so I started, you know, I grew up in Nebraska, went to a school very similar to uh, Loris or Clark or UD called Doan, a liberal arts school, and, you know, took my first job. And to be honest, I was only there for six months. I got, uh, I had a math degree and I took a job in construction management. And after about six months, I figured out that that was not the long term. Um, so I had moved to Sioux Falls and decided that wasn't, you know, not going to be the right path. So I, I changed. And uh, then I ended up with a, an insurance company doing uh, uh, actuarial analysis um, out of Omaha. But I would say the thing that I gleaned is if it's not the right fit, you got to find what is. But if you jump around too much, it looks pretty bad on your resume, right? So once you are a manager and a leader, you have to make sure you're giving it enough effort and time to make sure things do come out. But if it's not, you know it, don't stick with it because otherwise you lose a lot of that, uh, your runway. But when, when I was, you know, when I was fresh out of college, I, 
I don't have an MBA. Uh, I didn't go for some of those advanced degrees. So a lot of my business exposure came through different business books and then just uh, my career, kind of the correct you know, experience on the job. So, but when I was reading business books, I always got more out of a biography. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody's got to take their personality and figure out what works for them, right? And I know I'm more of an analyst. I, I know what my strengths and weaknesses are. So I usually can try to figure out where I need to develop myself, what I need to get exposure to. But the big thing is trying to get as much exposure as possible. Um, so early in my career uh, as an analyst, I, I got relatively decent at the work, which was uh, developing rates, things like that, to where I almost got kind of bored. So then projects would come along and I was the guy that took everything. So uh, I always did better when I was busy. Um, so if there's projects or initiatives, that really got me exposure to a lot more of the company. And the more projects I got, um, the more I got to understand how different areas of the company worked. So whether it was at ours, it was claims, customer service, et cetera. Uh, I was surprised as I got into other areas how few people really understood why they did what they did, right? I was talking to somebody that had been paying claims for years, and they didn't know what our value proposition was. They didn't know who our customers were. Um, they were really good at paying claims. They were really good at, uh, you know, and great person. They just never occurred to them to ask why and try to understand you know, why would a customer come buy something from you versus from somebody else? Um, and it, it was amazing to me how few people in the company really asked that question or tried to figure out what what it is that you do different or what is your value proposition or how do you sell? Um, and especially people that are in analytics and further and further removed from marketing or sales or some of those outward facing, it's really hard when you're internal to keep that stuff in mind. Um, so that was one that, you know, we, the, you know, the company I was with was called World Insurance, and we basically were a small individual health carrier that operated in like 30 different states, but we only had maybe 300 employees. So, but the cool thing was we acquired a lot of businesses. So I would go out on due diligence, um, and we would see... So say we have acquired a company in uh, West Virginia and you'd have to go out and do due diligence. Well, at that point you would see how their or their staff were organized, you know, how their management structure worked, how their, um, the culture as far as like dress code and hours of operations and all those different things, what systems they use to pay claims, to do uh, pay commissions, to line up brokers, Everybody had a different way of solving the same problem. And the more exposure you could get to seeing it, seeing the same problem solved 15 different ways, you could figure out what you thought was best and kind of in your head start to put together, how can that work and how can I make that work as well as possible? Well, as you start moving on or up in your career, all of that exposure gets you to question the, the norms, right? You're uh, you're always trying to figure out how all the puzzle pieces fit together and looking at everything and saying, well, we're going to do it that way because we've always done it really is not the right answer because the situations change, the markets change, the timings change, the leadership's changed, right? You got a different direction. Um, so you're always wanting to question those whys and trying to get out ahead of it. The uh, one, one thing that was huge for me in my, uh, in my career there, which I was there eight years, and that was the place that I started as an individual contributor and became a first-time manager. Um, but the big piece that I did when I was an individual contributor was I uh, I took on competitive intelligence. So at the time, you know, our sales VPs, our actuaries, our other people would try to do strategic planning, and they would come up with what do we do. How, how do we position ourselves? How do we market ourselves, et cetera? Well, there's a lot of busy work to going out and doing market research and just trying to figure out what's there and what's not. Well, when, you, when you're the person, and we didn't have that function, so people were asking questions, I would just do an ad hoc off the side, and then I'd report back to the salesperson, you know, the sales lead or 
uh, the COO or whoever was asking the question. And I turned it more into a formal process where um, I would actually go out and I had a bunch of friends that were programmers and they would go out and actually screen scrape off of websites uh, different information about our competitors, what they were doing, how they were doing it, what their price point was, uh, how they were rating for different things. And we put it into more of a systematic approach and it got tied into our strategic planning process. Well, now I'm 25 <clears throat> sitting in quarterly meetings with the senior executives presenting a lot of uh, the information that I had gathered. Well, it gave you a, an opportunity to really share they can see how you think, they can see how you process, you get a lot more exposure, and it's good for you because you get more confident to realize that everybody's just people, right? You go to these, the intimidation factor goes away, you realize that you know they're all trying to solve for the same problems you are, and that every role is equally as important within the organization. So, so that was a lot of the, the takeaways when I was fairly early on in my career. Um, and it, it Again, whether it be business books, whether it be acquisitions, whether it be uh, just talking to other people in the hallway, the more exposure to different ways of thinking and different ways of solving problems and different ways of organizing businesses, the better you're gonna be if you get to those, you know, if you wanna get to those next levels of management and keep moving on your career. So, well, from there I moved on to be a first time manager, which I ended up managing the guy that trained me, uh, which was awkward to be honest, um, but, you know, fortunately he was good at what he was doing. He just, he didn't want to do more, right? He, he was comfortable and a lot of people are, and you great, you know, you need people that are passionate about what they do and want to do that. And they're not always looking for the next thing. Um, but it feel, still felt kind of a slap to him a little bit when, when I got promoted over him. Uh, so I had a team, maybe eight or 10 people. Um, and, when they were your prior peers, you had to, there was this period, transition period where you basically, the more you can enable them. So if I basically stayed out of his way other than solve problems, and if he had issues, he'd come to me and I'd have to go deal with them, then you pro provided value to those folks, right? Because most of the time you're not the expert anymore once you start moving uh, away from the work. So, you know, I, I never liked, I don't, I don't like confrontation. Nobody does. Uh, but obviously that's a part of being a first time manager where you're, you're close to the front line. You're dealing with everything from being late for work to dress code to uh, performance issues. And when you're not used to management, you know, I wasn't trained on that. I have a math degree in economics, which is not business management. You kind of have to get a feel for, uh, for your team and what, what might it kind of motivates them? So first off, I, I, I figured if I could be liked and respected by everybody, that's great. Uh, but that's how, it probably means I'm not doing my job because I'm not addressing things. Uh, so if you're truly liked by everybody and you're super popular, you might want to look at whether or not you're really that good a manager because, or, or what is laying out there that's not getting addressed. So I always said, if I can be, if I have to choose one between respected and liked, I'd choose respected. And I think as long as you're consistent, you don't show favorites, you don't throw under people under the bus. Um, you know, I think there's the ability to earn that respect, even if you're having to deliver hard messages. Um, so I think over my career, I'm sure there's certain people that really didn't like me. Uh, that's just part of the gig. And you kind of have to figure out whether you're okay with that. Nobody likes to not be liked, to be honest, I, or at least most people don't. Um, so uh, figuring figuring out that, that just because you go to work and you do the right thing, that somebody dislikes you, or if your job just goes in a different direction, it's really not about you or figuring out how to deal with that when you go home so you don't feel bad, um, I think is, is a challenge for people, uh, especially first-time managers. It was for me. Uh, having to fire someone the first time, and I didn't actually fire, we eliminated positions, but I didn't sleep for like two days before I had to go have that conversation because it's somebody's livelihood, right? They're, that you're correcting an issue because you're either overstaffed or they're not sitting in the right seat, but that doesn't mean it's easier on you once you're empathizing with their situation. Um, so it, 
again, those are very challenging things that he'll earn you respect, but you're not always going to be liked. The uh, the next piece was really identifying what motivates people. You know, some people are motivated by a challenge. Some people are motivated by money, right? Intrinsic versus extrinsic. You know, doing the right thing, uh, being challenged versus extrinsic. You know, getting rewards, getting pat on the back, getting financials. And the more you can kind of read people on your team to know what makes people the most uh, motivated to get the work done, I think those are the the anecdotes. You know, I, I had one guy that you give him a spot bonus, whereas the other, if 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 he wasn't challenged, you just had to keep dumping more and more work on, on one of the ladies that worked for us. Um, and if she was bored, she was unhappy, and then she would kind of create other problems. So figuring out what motivates people, figuring out how to leverage those things uh, was something that, again, was not inherent uh, as I went and I kind of had to figure out as, as it went. Uh, acquisitions can be bad. So while it was great when we were acquiring, it was not so great when we got acquired. So I was at World Insurance. Uh, we were purchased by a company called American Republic Insurance. And for, that was about four years into me being there. I was there another four years, and I actually ended up managing people in both Des Moines at American Republic and in Omaha at World Insurance. But after four years, they had basically consolidated the work or a lot of it back into Des Moines. So they eliminated my position along with all the other managers and above. Well, that kind of shook me because I was really loyal to the company. I had put in lots of time and energy, and it felt like, uh, like the company wasn't as loyal to me. But you also realize that if you're trying to med, meld cultures, right, they had... World Insurance was kind of this scrappy organization that was pretty aggressive. American Republic was a, a little more structured, uh, didn't have the same level of aggressiveness. Well, part of that acquisition over time was eliminating the, the management team. Well, of course, you can't tell the managers that you're going to do that because you need them to run the business until you can get it tied together. So I think that was the first time that I really realized that it doesn't matter how good you are at your job sometimes, you can get fired. And just because you get fired, that doesn't mean you can't be a CEO someday. Um, the, the cool thing for me was I had been there so long that once I left, it really revalued what I was worth, right? I, I had been getting my four, three, four or five percent increases for years. But once I left, I actually made 50 percent more than what I did in the role I was in because it forced me out of that comfort zone. And had that not happened to me, I don't know. I may still be there today. And so I think everybody takes their path, but you don't always have to look at kind of those setbacks as setbacks. They're, they're life learning pieces that really can help you step into the next uh, phase. I think the hardest part for me was really the sense of accomplishment. Um, when you manage, you get further and further away from the work. And uh, I, I, you know, I used to do spreadsheets. I could write little computer programs. Um, all those things gave you this feeling of accomplishment at the end of the day, like, yeah, I did something. Well, then you get into management and you don't get to do as much. You know, most managers are working managers and they might still get to do 50% of their time doing work and the other 50% managing staff or going to meetings or designing, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I have a wood shop at the house. So I go home and I want something tangible. So I'll go home and build a piece of furniture before I had a two-year-old. Now I have a two-year-old and he pretty much takes up all the time at home. But um, but you need to figure out an outlet. If you're like me and you have to have some sense of accomplishment, then you, and you don't get it from just managing people or from going to meetings, you need some kind of outlet in order to tie that back together. So the other piece was, well, I, I was the expert. I was super efficient at doing you know, analysis. I could turn out reports. I could turn out all kinds of stuff really quick. And, you know, the people that were reporting to me were not as efficient as I was, or I didn't think so anyway, but I was pretty confident in my abilities at that point. But I, I kind of came up with the concept of, for, or to me, the concept of force multiplier, right? If I'm doing my job and I'm the best at it, I can only do 100% of my job. But if I have eight people doing similar work and they're 
90% as successful, you know, as efficient as I was, I'm having more impact on the organization, more impact on a lot of things by being that uh, multiplier. Um, the other piece is, you know, you get so used to saying yes to kind of move up the ladder that now you have to start saying no. Uh, holding people accountable and not doing the work is a lot harder than just doing it yourself. Um, as in teaching people, forcing them to learn stuff versus just giving answers, those are, are challenging. And then I, I will tell you, you know, if you take credit for your team's accomplishments without actually uh, giving them praise or or if something goes wrong, you blame the staff rather than putting it on you. You know, you always hear this mirror concept. Um, you know, if it's if it's something good, uh, you look through the look through the window. If it's something bad, you look in the mirror. Well, that really speaks to the next levels of management above you. You know, it it's very easy to see if you're throwing somebody on your team under the bus. It doesn't reflect poorly on you if you say, "Yeah, my you know I did it. I'm responsible." But you need to start saying no to your team, and then you know make them do it. But then you have to be accountable for it. So it's really give credit, take blame. Any questions on any of this uh, before I kind of move to the next stage? Um, I don't see any questions popping up. Feel free to okay. trudge forward. All right. So the you know I was I did actuarial analysis. I did competitive intelligence, and then I moved into product management. Um, product management is basically everything from how you package your your products, how you go to market, how you sell them but it really gives you exposure um, to a lot of different functions. So that got me to where they promoted me to a director position, uh, which was even more removed from the work, but I was really, that's when I started having staff in both, uh, in both uh, Omaha and Des Moines. So, but now you're managing managers. So it, uh, it's interesting because you're no longer the expert, on anything um, you know you've you've probably been far enough removed from the work at, during your manager phase that people are going to somebody else on the team as the subject matter expert and then now so you're not the expert on the function that you kind of came up and now you've inherited a bunch of teams and functions that uh, that you never understood so trying to figure out knowing enough you know I always figured out on on kind of a vertical line how deep I could go. So in a in an insurance company, you you figure out okay on a health plan you've got claims, you got customer service, you got actuarial, you got IT, you've got uh, member service, provider relations, etc. And it's like well I know I can go pretty deep on and when I say deep I have a deeper understanding of of underwriting, of actuarial, of sales, of marketing. But I don't, I can't go as deep when it comes to claims or operations or other things. Well, that means you have to trust the people that do that. Um, so trying to get a read for the person, trying to figure out, you know, getting some metrics, but also understanding those people becomes very, uh, very important when it comes to, to managing or, or moving on to that director stage. Director was the first time I really had a budget. Um, you know, I, I I knew we spent money, I knew we brought in revenue, but I never really had a, a functional responsibility for managing a budget, right? How many staff I need, what supplies, uh, and that was different, uh, which again, without having a bunch of formal training, you're basically learning on the job. So you're also trying to meet the budget as well as set up the budget for that area going forward. Medical associates is interesting because we have, uh, you know, we have 26, basically 26 different specialties. Um, each one's got a budget. So you're basically managing 26 small companies under one bigger company. Well, that means each manager is responsible for their department budget and then each director is responsible for a section of the companies. Uh, budgets. So if we're a $200 million company and we have four directors, each one's responsible for $50 million of trying to make sure that that the budget that you can hit, that you're generating revenue, that you're not going over in expense, et cetera. 
Um, so that I didn't really learn or have have accountability uh, on any large stage until I kind of moved on to that director stage. Now every company is different. It might be at the management level, it might be at the chief level. But the other piece is I I applied for a job as a director of I can't remember what it was, but I didn't get it. Um, and you know I was pretty unhappy because I had always been kind of uh, doing well or doing relatively well in the business world, but I, I figured out I didn't have the skills. You know, they were looking for someone who had outward facing uh, experience. So if you're, if you look at yourself and say, okay, what job do I want? Do I want to be a chief marketing officer? Do I want to be a chief operating officer? Do I want to be a CEO? You got to kind of compare that to what am I good at? What exposure do I need for me? I needed sales and marketing. I needed, I had done behind the scenes sales, um, doing, you know, requests for proposals and other things, but I had never actually been client facing. So I actually had to change jobs. I went to uh, a different company. I went from Coventry to Blue Cross because I applied for a, a CMO, chief marketing officer position at Coventry, didn't get it. So I flipped up to Blue Cross and that's where I got, uh, I said, you know, I know all this product stuff, I can help you with that, but if I'm gonna move up here and take my family with me, then I'm gonna to wanna to try to get client-facing exposure. So I brought that up during the interview and they committed to doing that. Well, that helped fill in some of the gaps in my resume um, for me to kind of get to that next level. And you know, once you're on the director side, you're further and further removed, now you say no more and more um, because now you're holding you know, you might have 200 people you're responsible for or 100 people versus 10. Well, you really are not in a position to to make a whole lot of changes on a regular basis. You basically are forcing folks to uh, to do their job and trying to keep a keep the, the ship straight at your level. Um, the new concept was really more, now you're starting to think out ahead, right? Uh, with management or individual contributor, you're spending a lot more time doing the work, processing the things, dealing with the day-to-day -day issues. Once you get to a director, you're going to spend 10% of your time thinking about next year and or the next year after. What are you going to need? How are you going to plan? What's the most likely scenario for uh, how business is going to come and, and kind of beat you up? Um, you know, for us in healthcare, we're regulated on our insurance company by three different states, uh, as well as the federal government by CMS. Each one changes their, their tune on a regular basis. On our clinic side, we, we face a physician shortage, right? There's not enough providers and we have an aging population. Well, if you don't start planning and thinking ahead for those things, that, then you're just reacting. So the whole being proactive really starts to phase in more as you get into bigger uh, roles within management. So, all right. Oops. All right. So, then, then I stepped into a chief. So my first role as an executive uh, was our COO of the health plan. So we have, uh, you know, all of my experience has been on the insurance side. Uh, I worked at. Blue Cross, well, Blue Cross, which was a nonprofit. I worked at Coventry, which was a for-profit. And then I worked at World Insurance, which was privately held, um, kind of smaller plans. And each one had a different culture. Each one had a different value proposition. Each one had a different way of getting the work done. So when I came to, to uh, Medical Associates, I had all that exposure, but I also had to respect that a lot of the success of the health plan was based on the team and the model and the things that were there. So figuring out um, what to change and where to focus uh, is extremely challenging. So for us, we had really good operations, but we had some some benefits we could have on some of our patient, uh, our nursing functions, our, our UM case management. So we kind of dug in in different areas and started to to peel apart your portion of the organization and, and figure out what's what's working well and where, where are the deficiencies. So this was the first role you really have profit and loss accountability for a, a function uh, or a functional area. 
for us, we have two operate two primary operating units, our health plan and our clinic. I ran the health plan. Brian Schatz, uh, our COO, who most of you know through uh, through the chamber, he ended up running the clinic uh, for the most part. And we do share things like a CFO and chief human resource officer and as chief medical officer, but we basically are each running our own business. Um, and then we report it up through through my boss, who is the CEO. Well, profit and loss means a lot more than just managing a budget, right? You're you're targeting in on revenue uh, opportunities. You're looking at, you know, for us, claims expense uh, at the health plan. I mean, we're we're managing a 200 million, you know, about 200 million dollars in claim spend, and our margins are about one percent, right? So you're you're doing a lot of transactions. We have 700,000 claims. Um, we've got like 300,000 phone calls. So you got this high volume, lots of stuff, but you're you're having to focus on the big picture and spending more and more of your time out ahead. So to me, this was the first time I really stepped out of a lot of the tactical decisions or you try to, because you have people that are better equipped to make those calls. Um, but if you if you do answer people, uh, they'll keep coming to you, right? It's that whole you you have to hold people accountable and force them to to answer their own questions. Um, and I realize I'm being fairly generic, but uh, you you know it's it's this weird part where you become no longer the expert on anything. So other than kind of guiding and making sure you're following your general guidelines, a lot of the day to day tactical decisions about should you how do you deal with this complaining customer or this specific account uh wants to bring in a different pharmacy vendor or this you know whatever the case may be there's always these the day-to-day -day stuff but as a chief you get more and more removed from that so that to me was kind of the separation where i probably spent 25 percent of my time dealing with tactical issues and 75 percent on strategy so whether that be managing our finances uh looking at different organization like how we how the departments work together how it all fits how all the pieces fit together um is really you know as a chief you get a lot more exposure so the other piece that i thought was was strange for me and once you're in some of these roles you end up speaking for the company um so i've always said as a nobody really knows where i stand on things whether it be political whether it be social etc because most of the time when I'm quoted, I'm representing the company. And especially when you come out with some sales background, you have to you have to sell to everybody. So you don't wanna alienate anybody by coming out with firm opinions one way or the other, which is why when you look at a lot of statements and things, they seem very uh, benign or very uh, uh, kind of in the middle. And a lot of times it's because, you know, whether somebody whether somebody agrees with your politics, whether or not, they're vaccinated or not vaccinated, whether they're this or that, you have to serve everyone, right? You've got a product, you've got a service, you wanna make sure that those people feel comfortable and now you're speaking for the company, not just yourself. So whether it be you know, pulling yourself off social media or being very cognizant about what you say and how you say it on social media, um, because now you're, you're no longer reflecting yourself. And, and that happens at every level of management. But the higher up you go, the more you get quoted, the more visibility, uh, the more you have to be cognizant about uh, when it's your voice versus when it's a company's voice. So, you know, this was a piece where I was spending more of my time thinking next year, two years, three years out. You know, if you want to go into Medicare Advantage, a new product, it takes three years. Well, if you're just dealing with day to day issues on claims and customer service and not getting three years ahead, then you're never getting to Medicare Advantage. You're never getting to those. But that also means you don't get that feeling of accomplishment because you might not even be in the same role three years from now to know whether it was accomplished or not. So you're setting the road work, but then not necessarily getting the feeling of, hey, I did something great, I got it done. You're, you're getting out ahead. Um, the other piece is now you're bringing along a whole piece of the organization. So, you know, Early on, you're trying to figure out what motivates people. You know, now you're building a narrative. You have to tell a story about where you're going and why you're going there to try to bring people with you, both internally and externally. So if I want to deliver a sales pitch to 
a chief human resource officer, it's a much different pitch than a sales pitch to a CFO, which is different than a CEO. And it's because you're having to build the narrative. It's the same facts, it's the same story, it's the same product, but you're having to say it differently. And when you're internally, if you're talking to someone clinical versus someone operational versus someone technical, you kind of have to communicate to each of them in their own way in order to, to get them to see where you're trying to take the organization. So if we're trying to launch an aesthetics line, right? We, we just opened a new aesthetic center. Well, when you're, when you're talking to uh, doctors who are, you know, doing a lot of medical things, some people want to do that, some don't. Um, so trying to convince different people as to why it's a good idea means you have to put together a, a bunch of facts and figures and stories that help them get to the same conclusion that you do. Um, so it's that nudge mentality. And, and the bigger organ, the bigger you're of an organization, the harder it is to do that directly, which is why it, you kind of, you have to pick kind of how you how you approach that. Um, so now I got my new role, which uh, which I started. You know, John Talent was the CEO here for I think 22 or 23 years. Uh, they announced that I was going to take over February of last year. Um, after running, after being at the help plan for five years, and I had to apply, right? They uh, they evaluated me for the role along with uh, other candidates and looked at my skill set compared to what the board came back with, what they wanted for the position. You know, you have to go through and they do all this uh, testing to figure out how are you wired, basically. Uh, are you aggressive? Are you more passive? Are you more analytical or more working with people um, in order to get things done. You know, I, how how is each person wired? And there is no right answer for who the CEO is. I happen to be, um, my skills or my background or how I'm wired seem to align with what our board was looking for. Um, but going through those exercises, I also realized where my deficiencies were. Uh, I'm not warm fuzzy, right? I I got married and I started sending out uh, uh, birthday cards for the first time, and I, I think my friends and family thought there was something wrong with me at that point. It's not that I'm not considerate; I just it just doesn't occur to me. Those things are, you know, some people are wired that way, some people aren't. But when you're guiding an organization, you have to have people that are worried about all those things. So for me, Brian is really the communicator. He's he focuses on the people. I'm I'm more the analysis, the technical, um, kind of the strategy piece. You know, Jeff Goner is our CFO. He fits a role where um, he's kind of got the, the strategy as well as uh, a lot of credibility with different stakeholders because he's been here 30 years. Um, you know, you got our, our chief human resource officer who's really focused on uh, keeping us out of trouble, making sure we're doing the right thing, trying to uh, improve the culture, making sure that we're keeping up with what you need for staff. Um, those things I'm not necessarily wired to do. So you have to know yourself. And and I think the further on in your career you get, the more naive you feel because you're further and further removed. And if you like that because you you like to learn, Feeling naive is great because there's a ton of things that you can get to learn and, and plug yourself in. But if you're arrogant and, and think you know better, then you end up not putting together a team to address kind of your, your weaknesses or your, um, I shouldn't even say weaknesses, just different gaps in your skills or gaps in your knowledge or things that aren't as motivating to you as they might be to someone else. So, so I really focused on putting the team together and I think we've, we've done a nice job uh, kind of aligning our executives because if you do something at the top level, then all of a sudden, you know, they drive the chiefs who drive, you know, the chiefs the, who drive the directors, who drive the managers, who drive the staff. You can have a lot of impact, both positive and negative, if you don't keep that level approach and try to, you know, be cognizant of where you have your deficiencies. Um, the other piece is, make sure you're finding people that are equally passionate about their stuff. So when I say dynamic tension, our senior team gets in, our executive team gets in a room and we bicker. It's uh, it's fun. We have very different lens on the same problem. 
So our C COO is really passionate about operations and he's a very strong personality. You know, Brian, he, he'll speak up, he'll represent his areas and he does it well. Uh, Hendrick or Dr. Schultz, who's our CMO, always wants to do the right thing by the patient, always wants to do the clinical thing. Jeff, our CFO, always wants to make money and make sure that the company is financially solvent. You know, Cheryl's always worried about the people as our HR person. Um, and you got to get these people in the room and let them push and you end up with a really good solution by bringing together that tension and forcing them to come to kind of the same you, if if one is stronger than the other you don't do the right thing clinically or you don't do the right thing financially or you don't do the right thing from a, a staff and operations perspective so you have to have strong passionate personalities that are all fighting for their turf but me as a ceo who was really passionate about the health plan i now have to step out of that and now find somebody else who's passionate about the health plan because i have to be objective and look across the different areas and make sure that i'm looking at it and being that that trump card if you have to come in if if the team doesn't come to the same conclusion which usually they do you then have to step in and help make those decisions um, but it's not very often right i i used to make lots of decisions every day now i make very few most of the day-to-day -day decisions go on you're just there trying to make sure the company aligns with the long-term goals uh, which sometimes makes it look like you're not paying attention to be honest it's weird i walk around the halls and I think people sometimes think I'm aloof, but it's usually because I'm thinking about a problem that's next year or two years down the road and I'm processing because that's what more envelops your time day to day. And if you don't get a sense of accomplishment out of that, you might not want to be a CEO, right? If you want to feel like you're doing stuff day to day and you want to have that. So that's why you kind of get this uh, Peter principle where you you go past what you what is the ideal stage and honestly, I'm still figuring out this role. I've only been in it for six six months. Um, but each role you're in, you kind of have to figure out, are you getting that sense of accomplishment? Are you getting, is it matching with your work-life balance? Is it matching with your financial hopes or expectations? Um, you know, it's, it's a combination. And that, like I said, there's a lot of people that want to be individual contributors. And that's great because every role within the company is important. The other piece that, Fortunately, I have uh, Rita as my executive assistant, and she thinks of all the little things. So whether it be, and I shouldn't say they're little, but stopping by to wish somebody a happy birthday or uh, handing out an employee of the month thing, uh, or you know, you're now not yourself, you're representing the company as a whole. So when the head of the company comes and remembers your birthday, people within the company talk about that, they think about that. So you can't lose track of the little stuff. Uh, you know, when you get a thousand employees, you can't remember everybody's birthday. But if you remember some, and and Rita does a great job at kind of making sure I'm I'm doing those things because it doesn't occur to me, like I said with birthday cards. But those things get talked about in the hallways. That's part of how people like where they work because they feel like people care. They feel like they're part of that. We have a really long tenured staff, and my predecessor John was great at doing that probably because Rita did the same thing with him. Um, but it goes a long way when it's there. Uh, the next piece is leading versus managing. Again, I spend so much of my time trying to get out ahead of things that I get further and further removed from the operations that I didn't even understand that that's what the role was necessarily when I took it. But it uh, it is different in how you, um, how you look at things. You're just, I used to get 200 emails a day now I get 50. They're more, they're harder, they're more complicated issues, and they usually have different prongs to them, but you're not in as much of the, you know, it, it it's surprising to me that I'm not busier on a day-to-day, -day, but I have more commitments after hours. I have more stuff in the evenings. I have more, you know, ways representing the company uh, that you really have to have to commit to those times. So um, part of Part of what's hard for me is where you know you no longer have a boss right i have a board but they meet monthly there's a chairman of the board but day to day there's nobody telling me what to do so i have to figure out where is my time best spent and this is kind of the first time i've had that opportunity to kind of grow and figure out where i want to spend my time and energy because the work's not going to come to you you have to create the work and go give it to other people 
Um, so it's, it's a different mentality versus, you know, versus individual managers, directors, et cetera, where a lot of times you're taking initiatives and, and executing versus roles where you're creating a lot more. And I think the last piece, you know, I, everybody's got a mission, vision, values, you know, uh, mission is what you're here for. For us, it's a uh, uh, better patient experience and exceptional healthcare. Um, vision is kind of where you're going. Values are who you are as a company. And in most roles, you don't think about those every day, but in the CEO role, you do. Um, so everything from, you know, you look at Disney, right? And, or Apple. Right, so their device versus their commercials versus the Apple Store, you know, everything fits together because that's Apple, right? You have to come up with this cohesive thing that aligns all of your decisions with your mission, vision, and values. So when we look at it, and we look at what do our facilities look like, how do our people interact with patients, are we, you know, is everybody getting talking to a doctor versus talking to uh, a nurse versus talking to a receptionist, and what does that look like, and how does that feel to the patient? Well, all of those things really have to come together. So we look at our brand in the community. We look at our, um, again, facilities and how people come in and go. We look at our dress code and, and our work expectations for staff and all of those pe different parts, because really you're looking at all the all the pieces that make you a company and making sure that they all fit together well so that when you're out in the community, people can say, oh yeah, that's Medical Associates, or oh yeah, that's Blue Cross, or oh yeah, that was Aetna. And each one is very distinct and unique. So, all right, well, I rambled through a bunch of, uh, of different things. Hopefully you have at least picked up a few um, nuggets of, uh, of information, but any questions come in? Well, first off, Zach, thank you so much. That was that was excellent. I really appreciate it. I love the breakdown. I think a lot of people appreciate the different uh, tiers that it takes to get to where you are now. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, question that came in is, you spoke about moving from an individual com contributor to a manager of eight people without formal training. Did you have a mentorship at work or did you read up and figure it out? If the latter's any recommendation uh, uh any recommendations uh no i uh i i will tell you that so at the time i was working for the chief actuary named val lent and she was a terrible people manager like really really nice lady really smart great at what she did but i uh, just kind of awkward and didn't know so no i i basically had to figure it out but i i I had a lot of time between um, Omaha and Des Moines because I had to go there every week driving back and forth. And there's this, now it's a, a service I think called Blinkist where you can get these 15 minute sound bites where they, have, they summarize business books. I had a whole bunch of business books that I would listen to going back and forth uh, for the two hour drive each way every week. So every week I'd have you know two or three abbreviated business books giving me different exposure. Um, and that really is where I learned most of it. Now I did have our, our chief marketing officer uh, and he and I, once I started to get in the role, I started to kind of treat him more, you know, we had more of a friendly dialogue and I would bounce things off him, uh, but he was super aggressive and he was salesy and I was over an internal department, so it didn't always align. So it's really getting, you kind of got to get a feel for it. But again, the, the thing I would recommend the most is get as much exposure. You know, but I learned more from the story of Nike or the story of GE or the story of you know different businesses that were successful than I did on business concepts where they would just come out and say, here's here's business con you know, business 101 type stuff. I had to have the context of of the different books and the narratives of you know, how Nike made a, a great brand or how GE made a great operating model or, you know, uh, or culture at Apple or, you know, different things to give you that exposure. So. Oh, I think you're muted. I thought I was going to leave that saying in 2020. Sorry. 
All right. So this question is, did you have any goal timeline when you were making uh, your when you were going through these stages? Did you have a plan to become a CEO? Yes and no. Um, I never wanted to get beyond my skill set. Right. I never wanted to be bad at a job. Um, but I knew that as I moved up, because I had to tell my wife up front, I was like, CEOs usually only last four or five years in a role. And part of that's not that you're bad at the job, it's that the company changes directions or you know the situation changes. So you have to kind of figure out, is that something you're even comfortable aspiring to? Because if you want to stay in Dubuque, it, you, know, you got to look at it from, we moved. I, I moved from Omaha to Fargo to Dubuque and my family's in Omaha and that's something that we, you know, my wife and I decided we were okay with. Um, so yeah, I always thought I wanted to be a CEO. Um, I didn't really have a time frame. You know, it, a lot of it is timing and opportunity. So if you if the position opens up and you apply and you don't get it, then you either have to figure out why and try to fill in those skills. I think that's the biggest advice I would give is know yourself. You know, look at put yourself in the hiring person's role and look at what a resume would look like, and then compare that to yours and what's not there. So my whole progression was filling in the pieces that weren't there that basically set me up. So even even at the at, for this role, I didn't have the exposure to the clinic. Well, I knew when I took the role over the health plan that I wanted this job once John retired. Well, I asked to take over marketing and an analytics function that allowed me to get more visibility into the clinic so that down the road, I would understand enough to be able to, to manage the organization. Well, if I wouldn't have taken on, you know, asked to take on marketing and asked to take on analytics and just on the health plan without trying to expand my my exposure and my uh, my resume, I probably wouldn't have been as good a candidate for the CEO role. So it's being very cognizant about what's there and what, and really cognizant about what's not there um, for for those positions. So. I love that. That's great. Do you have a recommendation on a specific business book or leadership book that you have read and really enjoyed? I honestly, I don't. Uh, that I, I would suggest some of those services that are kind of the uh, again the one that that I, that's been advertised lately is this Blinkist thing, and it's basically a I think it's a hundred dollars a year or something to become part of it, but it's fifteen minute snippets. Um, you know, I, I like things like the four hour work week. I like things like uh, rich dad, poor dad. I like things like re-engineering the corporation, you know, but I pick up tidbits out of every one of them. And then I have to meld it with my personality and my style to figure out what works for me. So I think there is no one playbook. You know, I've read, you know, MBA and uh, uh, the abbreviated MBA books. I've read a lot. But I don't really read much. I listen all the time because I got a lot of time driving. So I would say just take advantage of that downtime to get exposure and grab the one or two. Th you know, I, there was a whole book on uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation that I thought was great. I can't even remember the name of the book, but I remember the concept. And that concept then kind of wires you to look at everybody and kind of figure out, you know, even, even when you're in healthcare, I, I like to bring this up. Healthcare kind of is a three-legged stool, right? You got the financing arm with the insurance company, you got the hospital, and you got the, the physician. Well, when you're looking at a CEO, you can usually tell where they came from because if they want to give you a tour of the building, they probably are from the hospital. If they want to talk about volumes, they probably came out of the, or clinical stuff, they probably came out of the doctor piece. If they would talk about the numbers all the time, they probably came out of the health plan. So knowing, you know, how they think allows you to, you know, whether it be a, an employee or uh, a partner, you know, I, I'm having to work, we work with Kay Takis, we, on, on the Mercy side, we work with Chad on Unity Point. Uh, I have a good relationship with Justin who runs the Grand River and really knowing how they're wired or how they think allows you to build those relationships better. And I think the more exposure you get in books, um, any of them is valuable, so. Um, do you have any best practices for building a company brand or rebranding? 
the example they gave is a con consulting agency or something internal. What have you found the is the best way forward? I think with branding, you know, I will tell you that I don't think we have a cohesive brand even here. Um, Blue Cross was great at it, right? They focused on branding. They had the the highest ranking brand in the area. Medical Associates has a brand because of the community we're in, right? We've been here a hundred years, people know what to expect and they have an expectation and that really is your brand. But I would say if you're building a brand, it's really doing um, surveys, you know, patient surveys or customer surveys of what they see and how they see you. And then trying to marry that with an employee survey you know, it's, everything should be market driven. So you should always be asking customers what they want or asking employees what they want. And then you bring all that feedback back together and they say, okay, I want a, a simpler dress code. I want uh, your, you you feel staunchy in your brand because it looks too corporate-y or you're not cohesive because you you now have an app, but you have a really old building. It To me, a brand is all about knowing who you are and, and trying to get focus on that and then bring all the pieces so that everything feels cohesive, whether it be a signature line on your email or your business card or how you do brochures or how you how people even talk about it, right? Your elevator speech that you put up in front of your employees that pops up on their screen every day. You know, to me, I'm really into melding the external and the internal brand and making sure that it aligns with your mission, vision, value. And I think the best way to know where you're at versus where you want to be is surveys, whether it be customer or whether it be employee. Love that. Uh, looks like we've got one more here. Uh, any recommendation for those in sales? Uh, you receive many vendor calls. What gets your attention and makes you want to pause and hear more? Most of the time, it's uh, it's what's causing me issues. So, you know, if uh, if I hear from our operator operations team that our our systems are causing issues with our strategy, then I take calls right for that specific vendor. Um, otherwise, I weed out a lot of things that unless it's causing issues or I see there's a big opportunity, um, I you know most of the calls get get screened out by Rita. She's very nice, which is good. But uh, but yeah, um, I'll tell her if I'm interested. Uh, in specific things. So we, we come up with our strategic plan, which addresses a lot of our, we identify opportunities, threats, strengths, weaknesses every year, come up with objectives. Those objectives really guide part of the organization. We align them with our, uh, our incentive plan. And then those objectives really guide what we're open to hearing about. So if we need to get more efficient on our, our call center, because we're now answering the call for people in the Quad Cities or Cedar Rapids or Iowa City, we're now in, our 24 hour nurse line is actually providing that service to Clinton and to others. Well, we need to get a more robust system than what we have now that we have more volumes. So that's the type of call I take. Um, so it's really whether or not there's a, a, a pending demand or if you can create one for me, right? If it's a new thing and you're, you can successfully go to a conference and convince us that we're missing something um, those are other ways that we you can get exposure. So. Excellent. Well, that looks like all the questions we have, and we're right up at one o'clock. So, Zach, thank you so much again for being here today. To all of our attendees, thank you so much for being here. Please check your emails. There's going to be an announcement coming soon for our next YP luncheon. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks, everybody.